the title of which is The New Energy Architecture. I think it's a grand title, uh, not only in, in name, but also in, in uh, complexity of it. But uh, we are lucky that we have a great panel today, and I'm, I'm sure that we can handle, not draw the whole plan of the new architecture of the future energy or energy security, but at least hint on the ways, on the problems first, and then also on the ways of resolving these issues and how it will like in 20, 30 years' time. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel, and our panel is, we have Atul Arya, Arya who is the head of research of IHS SERA from United States. We have uh, Mr. Boyko, who is the Minister of Energy uh, and Coal Industry of Ukraine. We have Lady Barbara Judge, who is Chairperson Emeritus of United Kingdom Atomic Energy Agency or Authority. Then we have Andreas Known, who is CEO of uh, Repower or Repower from Germany and uh, a renewable energy company. And we were, it's announced, uh, we were supposed to have Mr. Trykov, Trico, it's in the program, but he is not here, who, who, was, who is the minister from B Bulgaria. And we have here Mr. Jumkila, who is the Director General of UNIDO. Uh, before uh, asking our panelists to make their contribution, I would like to make a small introduction. And I started saying that it's a very uh, ambitious uh, title, because if you look at the current, if I look at the current energy architecture and I think about it as a, as a city, the city that comes to me is a sort of a a uh, city somewhere in Asia and, and a very old city like uh, Calcutta or Bombay which has grown fast effectively the last several years so it's a combination of poor areas, middle class, sometimes no communications, no connections but a city with a lot of wealth, new energy coming so it's a, it's a big mixture that's the way I see the modern architecture of energy today what is that I personally would hope to, to, to see as an energy, energy architecture for the future in the future? When I was walking today after the, the rain in, in Vienna, I thought basically maybe this is what we would like to have for future energy architecture. A beautifully designed city where everything is balanced. The green parks with the beautiful buildings, there is electricity hitting everything. Sometimes they'll be missing something like air conditioning in this hall but that's okay. So the ideal that we would like to get there in uh, energy architecture is something like uh, beautiful Vienna. But of course it's complex and complicated. Why? Because it's complex, it's speedy, and uh, the changes are speedy, and we are having a lot of challenges. And these challenges are multi-dimensional. First of all, if I look at, may, let me just uh, give a couple of these dimensions. The first one is the nature of the challenge. First of all, energy is not, we're not speaking about just energy security or energy challenge. Energy is very, very closely related to, to environment or climate change. It's very strongly connected with food and water. So whenever we are speaking about about energy, we have to take into account we're speaking about all of these issues. And I, at least, we, I haven't seen recently a very good research, and maybe this is for, for you, uh, Mr. Arya, uh, a, a proper sort of a comparison based on a dollar or on calorie of a connection between energy, water production, and food. A gram of a food or a gram of a water connected with energy and CO2 consumption. Now, of course, uh, the second dimension will be political. Anything that we do in energy sector is either political or politicized. We don't have at the European Union a common energy uh, policy. Anything happens between Ukraine and, and, uh, and Russia in uh, gas supply is highly politicized. In many places, we'd love to see more international law and order. There are more than 100 institutions, that, uh, international organizations that are working with this or that aspect of energy. But 
We don't have one grand organization where everybody comes together and basically faces the difficulties and tries to find the balance between renewal, coal, climate, food and water, anything. So we are missing a big one, although we have more than 100. The third one probably I would say about the infrastructure. Third dimensions of complexity is infrastructure. Infrastructure at the end of the day is not only pipelines. There are success stories in Europe, in Eurasia. Nord Stream could be seen as a success, although it made uh, unhappy initially a couple of countries. We are still have the issue of how to supply with what, which sort of uh, pipeline the south of Europe. Is it going to be South Stream, Nabucco, or any other that the region is, and where the, uh, the energy is going to come, from which part of Caspian? Infrastructure is also electricity greed. It's becoming smarter and smarter and becoming more uh, complicated and more dangerous because the more smarter it is, the more it is uh, vulnerable to cyber crime. So with the electricity smart grids, we are going to inherit, all to, we have to resolve the issue related to cyber. Of course, another fourth dimension would be the financial. Are our tariffs right? Do we have common tar tariffs between countries? And how, where do we get the investment to build? And how do we encourage rene renewable energy? The fifth dimension will be, I'll call it the rise of China. This is a challenge for specifically Eurasia. Because one of the sources of energy for Europe is, going, is concentrated in the area around Caspian, Central Asia. And in the meantime, there was a success which is called Baku Tbilisi Jehan. But if Europe will, will continue being a bit slow and slow, then there is the rising star of China. And the Chinese are very effective and very quick in that area. So there will be more and more pipelines running from Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, or the Caspian towards the east. So I think there is the dimension of China here. And of course, there are, uh, there's another sixth uh, dimension of complexity, which I will call here probably new discoveries. Be that new discoveries like the shell gas in, in Europe, which has changed completely, and we are talking about energy security in Europe differently today than three years ago or four years ago, or the rise of LNG, or indeed the new types of, of renewables. Seventh, I think I will stop there. I will call it the balanced portfolio. I think everybody wants to have a balanced portfolio, starting having, of course, uh, clean coal going into oil products because we need in transportation. And the, the gas is rising. Are we going to keep nuclear or not? This is one important question. And where and how the, the renewables will grow. So with this, of course, seven is not the final number. There are more complex dimensions. But I will stop there and I will ask my first question to uh, Lady Barbara. And this is, of course, ask her to make her presentation. Of course, I do understand that it's going to be around nuclear. Right, absolutely. Thank you very much, Armin, and brilliant as always. If you were here at the opening session this morning, you would think that nuclear was dead. Certainly if you listen to the heads of the Austrian government, who were g glad to tell us that they'd banned nuclear a long time ago. And frankly, if you looked at what happened in Germany, you would wonder about Mrs. Merkel and whether or not she had, how she had changed her mind in such a short period of time. And frankly, there are other countries in Europe that are not going to do nuclear now that were, but for Fukushima. Fukushima has, to some degree, changed the game. But if you think about what the three questions are with respect to energy, all energy, energy security, do we have enough energy? Energy independence, where is it? Can it get to us without crossing a lot of national boundaries where we may or may not have pipelines or peace? And climate change, do we want to wreck the environment for our children and our grandchildren? The only one kind of energy that ticks all those boxes at a baseload kind of energy is actually nuclear. Do we have enough? You build a nuclear plant, you build it as big as you need it. Do, is it energy independence? Where is it? You build it in your country and climate change. We all know that nuclear doesn't emit carbon. So why weren't we building nuclear all this time? Well, we were originally, as you remember. Then we had Chernobyl. I'm going to go quickly because we have a short time and Three Mile Island. Chernobyl was an old technology, badly maintained with the 
the apparatus being pushed by the operators. Three Mile Island wasn't a failure, it was a success, actually. Nobody died, nobody was even hurt. It was just, if you remember, Jane Fonda and that movie, that lovely movie, The China Syndrome, where she told us that we were gonna have a nuclear accident, and six weeks later we did. And now we have Fukushima, which is a big industrial accident. And so if you think about what, what's happened and look at Europe, you will say Fukushima is the third strike, Austria, Germany, Italy, Sweden, um, Switzerland, numbers of countries that didn't want nuclear in the first place in the rebirth are probably gonna pull back as a result of Fukushima. But if you, this, conf, this conference is Europe and Central Asia and Asia and the developing world. If you look at Turkey, if you look at the former Soviet Union countries, if you look at Poland, if you look at China, if you look at India, if you look at, in Europe at Finland or France or the UK, you will see that many countries are in fact continuing on their nuclear program. So what is it? What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that companies and countries and governments are going to have to look carefully about the nuclear plants that they intend to build, but build them they still will. They'll have to look at the policies and practices around nuclear, but they'll still build them. And quickly, because I always say that when you think about nuclear, the policies mostly all begin with P, just by chance. So first of all, nuclear is a political issue. Armin said that, the Austrian said that this morning. Mrs. Merkel certainly showed us Somebody once said it's a sovereign issue, but you have to have the government behind you if you're going to build a nuclear power plant. The next one is planning. Where are you gonna put the plant? Well, we learned from Fukushima that placing the plant in the right place, all these Ps, is very important. And we also hear that not in my backyard, nobody wants to live near a power plant. That's wrong. Most people who understand the power plant want it when they can have it. In the UK, right after Fukushima, right after it, the population around the place where we were gonna build a new power plant voted 65% in favor of having the power plant near them because they know it's big infrastructure projects, brings jobs, brings money. But P is planning. The next one is price. Nuclear is expensive to build a big infrastructure project, but once you have it, it's base load generation. It goes all the time. It's not like renewables, sun and wind, which is top up and it's at a relatively moderate cost once you build the power plant. They say nuclear is cost effective when oil is about $60 a barrel, and nobody really thinks oil is gonna be less than $60 a barrel for any sustained period of time. The next P is people. There is a skill shortage. We have to train more engineers who know how to run plants. We train a lot of engineers, but then they go get MBAs, and they become financial engineers. And actually, we need more engineers who will build things, build bridges, build tunnels, build plants, people. There's the press, that's another P. We have to be transparent. If we don't explain to the press what's going on, and that was part of Fukushima, the press was going every day about what was going on there. Frankly, if you don't get the press on your side, it's not, it's not gonna be happening. And then there's one more issue. There are numbers of other issues, but there's one more issue that I don't have a P for. And if anybody could give me one, I'd be delighted, which is waste, a big W. Because there is the waste issue, and we have to deal with the waste. Now, in fact, the world is mostly determined that the way to deal with the waste is called deep geological storage. You build a big road, the Finns are doing it. You build a big road down into the center of the earth. You build a cavern, sorry. You place the rods in, you close up the cavern, and it's good for more than a thousand years. Now, Actually, they say a thousand years is um, not very long, but if you remember the Hong Kong experience of giving back China to Hong, Hong Kong to China, that was 99 years. And I was there at the time and I said, why are you guys giving back China? I thought you were giving back Hong Kong to China. I thought you won the war. And they said, Barbara, 99 years from the people in the late 1800s was equivalent to forever. So we're saying now a thousand years is a long time. So what am I going to say? Basically, Fukushima was important. There'll be a big tension. Another big P is permissions, regulation. There'll be a big tension about making sure the regulator isn't too close to the operator and there's a competitive tension. There'll be a big focus on the safety features of the new technology. But those countries that were going to build nuclear power plants 
and had the government behind them are continuing to build them. I'm not saying this is a silver bullet. We need everything. We need nuclear, we need coal, we need oil, we need gas, we certainly need renewables. If we're going to go from 6 million to 9 million people, it's not a zero-sum game. We need a bouquet of energy sources. But I'm just saying I don't think we can count nuclear out. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. I think from your presentation, uh, it, it appears that after an uh, unfortunate tragedy in Japan, the world from the point of view of nuclear has become much more sort of a clear and polarized. There are those who will not accept, at least in the near future, because of public uh, opinion, because of green movement and then uh, philosophy behind that. There are those who, will, who were and will continue doing, like France and other countries, but there are also interesting special cases. For me, there are two countries that are of special interest. One of them is Kazakhstan. Maybe we'll come to that later. And the other one is, is where you come from, which is UK. Uh, I think UK has around 19 nuclear power plants. But it's, it's the country that has lost one of your P's, which is people. <laughs> you don't have universities or uh, engineers who are trained. So what's going to be the future? You are the person that is uh, the best position to answer that question. The UK, you're exactly right, Armin. The UK was where we, nuclear started. Some 60 years ago, the first power plants were started in the UK and then in America. And over the years, because of Chernobyl, because of, because of Three Mile Island, and just because of the low price of oil, the UK essentially lost its technology. And then, to be fair, we sold Westinghouse to the Japanese just at the moment of the nuclear renaissance, which some of us thought wasn't exactly the best policy for our government to do. But now we're trying to get the people back. We are actually putting in chairs of nuclear energy, getting our universities trained up, getting our people trained up. and. Even now, after Fukushima, we're going full speed ahead on building our power plant. We did send our head regulator over to Fukushima to write a report on the lessons learned, and we will learn all the lessons, but we believe that, we, that nuclear is very important to our energy mix. We have to say that a lot of our power plants are going to be built by the French. I mean, the French EDF has spent so much money buying British energy from us that they are going to come over with their technology, and it's a point of national pride for them to build our power plant using our people. Well, thank you, Barbara. I think you said about selling a wasting house to Japanese. In fact, you also sold 10% to, to Kazakhs. Uh, a regional power of energy. And with this, I would like to come to another very important country for the whole Eurasia, an important country for, uh, for Europe in many aspects, specifically on energy, and that country is Ukraine. And I would like to ask Minister Boyko to, to make his first remarks, and then we'll go ahead. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I was sitting listening that I think last year, energy sector was the most dynamic changes, demonstrated dynamic changes than even any other industry in the world. When we remember that was half a year ago, I think from that time our energy map was changed fully in, the, in all the world. I named only three things which was changed the world in energy sector last year. First, it was technical revolution in America about shale gas, which was changed gas map of the world and uh, bring new, new routes, new possibilities to great number of countries. Second, we came to the to the second decade of 20th century with fully unpredictable situation with oil prices. And uh, as it was before, I think that uh, the main danger of economical crisis depends of unpredictability in oil sector. Because today only 12% of oil is selling and purchasing as oil as natural project. 70, 80, 80, uh, eight percent is only papers. And this financial speculation process brought very great danger to all the countries who is depends from oil sector. 
And second, and the third one is uh, what was mentioned by my colleague, it was situation with nuclear. But because before Fukushima, I was quite sure, and the uh, main uh, number of political experts was quite sure that the uh, future of mankind is fully depends from the nuclear sector. Because the growing markets of India, the growing markets of China, without nuclear energy, will not improve in a good way. And today, it was half a year ago, only half a year ago. Today, all the mankind, I think, uh, must think it over and make policy, common policy, for improving energy sector. Because every country has his own national strategy of improving energy sector using their national interest. According to my country, it's growing to, it's uh, improving gas sector, it's reconstruction uh, our transportation system because 80% of Russian gas is coming to Europe using our tubes. And in the, in the, in the next month we begin the most big reconstruction works about our transportation system. It's very important for Europe, it's very important for Russians, for us, for all who are connected with the gas sector. And uh, we, ha we must think of a new policy in nuclear sector. Because we also have 15 nuclear plants, and we shall consider new policy in this sector according to Fukushima situation. We put new process big money in this sector and think it over in order to avoid situation what was happened to our regret in Japan. And uh, the last thing I want I, I want I can mention that um, you know <clears throat> I think all the mankind changed and it's necessary to European Union especially to make to have common policy in energy sector because it's very, it became situations when common policy of European Union considered Nabucco as priority, and several countries from the same European Union consider South Stream, for example, as priority. And it will be one day when it, they must make a choice. What is the priority, if what will they will build, Nabucco or South Stream, because all of them came in one market. That's why I think that uh, it's our common house and it needs uh, very careful attention and very, very good considering with all the players in this market. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Minister. I think uh, you ended speaking about uh, South, uh, South Stream and Nabucco. Uh, I, I do remember years ago when the, the first pipeline from Baku going to Jehan was on, on its way to be made. It was a huge issue, Political, a lot of politicians didn't believe that it's going to happen. It was needed a strong political, financial, and I, I mean uh, human resource to, to, to make it happen. Uh, this year at Davos I had this discussion with President uh, Aliyev from Azerbaijan, and he was just saying me simple truth that basically today we don't care which pipeline, because whoever builds first will benefit taking the, the gas or the oil from the region. From the point of view of Europe, it's better. The more pipelines, the better. The higher the security of supply to the region. But uh, at the end of the day, this is one way of securing Europe's energy sector. The other way is looking at new resources. And Ukraine has just found shale gas. And that's, I think, exciting, first of all. It will uh, make Ukraine, from energy point of view, much more self-sufficient and secure. But also, it's one of the first countries that will start exercising. So my question is to you, have you already started giving licenses to that? What's the plan? You know, we, we, we considered very carefully what was happened in America and uh, what is the experience of Americans in this technical revolution. And I think that uh, what is doing now in Europe, 
uh, we're passing this way only quicker than it was in America. It uh, takes them 20 years to bring these uh, projects. But uh, for us, it's, I think it will be for five, seven years. And we already, yes, yes, we already began this process. We gave first licenses, we prepare auctions, and several American companies already signed agreements with our national companies in order to improve, in order to begin this work. And um, we are going to provide conference about shale gas with uh, our colleagues from, from Sierra uh, Agency in uh, November in order to show the perspective not only in our country, but also in whole Europe. We consider that shale gas is, uh, I mentioned that it was technical revolution with fully changed gas map all over the world. And I think that we shall pass this way quicker, we shall pass it for five, seven years, as I mentioned, and we, our government, our president showed us that it must be done very quickly. According to pipelines, which is uh, several projects, is building now and uh, going to build now from Caspian region. I think what is important for Europe, not only have new route of gas, but have diversification of resource base. And that's why when it is considering situation Nabucco or South Stream for Europe, it's, I think it must be clear that Nabucco is new resource base, but South Stream is the same base as it was today. And that's why <coughs> our position is to propose uh, to our Russian partners, because we, today we have very good, very pragmatic and uh, very eff effective connections with our Russian partners, to invite them to reconstruction process at, as it is doing the European Union of our system, and to make it more effective, more reliable, that's what we are doing for in the nearest next months. Thank you. Minister, um, uh, we spoke about gas and, uh, and oil and gas, uh, gas uh, mostly, but your title says that you, you are Minister of Energy and Coal Industry, which specifically emphasizes the importance of coal for Ukraine. That brings me to a question about uh, uh, climate change and environmental issues, and especially when you are speaking about also shell gas. Is it going to be an issue for Ukraine? the development of the shell from the point of view of environmental concerns. I understand that you invited me to a clean coal, te clean coal technology, which is very good produced in Europe, and just now we is bringing from Europe to China. You know, we, are, we consider that experience, and we consider that uh, only burning coal without new technologies is not effective in any case. Not economically, not ecologically, and every, every station, every equipment which we building now in our country is building, is going to build, only using new technologies in this area. And um, especially I consider the example of shale uh, refinery in uh, Maastricht as example what must be done in a situation of saving clim climate changes in and, it, and meanwhile using coal as an effective and good energy resource. We go using this way. Well, thank you, Yuri. And I come to Andreas. I think we had the portfolio where you had the energy. We spoke a little bit about gas and coal. Now is the time for you know, renewables. Good news. You are running one of the most successful companies. Tell us what's good. Um, yeah, first I would like to say thank you, that's my first uh, World Economic Forum and I'm delighted to be here. And um, the title of this, this first se or my, or this session is Energy Architecture, and architecture thinks like there's some, some architect, some planner behind it. And um, now um, if I just look back at my, my career, which was partly in Forsyth, I worked two years in the UK and uh, I was in the midst of building combined cycle power stations when we got a fax from Tony Blair saying no more combined cycles, gas is off for two years. So at that time, um, 
it's not architect, it's not planned. And now we have, of course, the opposite, what happens at the moment in Germany, which is clearly um, something that should probably be done in several years, now it gets done in weeks. And I know it's not to, to the liking of everyone, but why don't we use this now as an opportunity to put it on new feet, on sustainable feet, and just say, what are the demands that we would like for a real energy architecture to have in the future? And here, Lady Barbara, I just take your, your criteria, which coincide, of course, not by chance, because um, is there enough? And here I can, can then make the case for wind as, uh, as one, um, one renewable energy source. There's in, in most countries of the world, um, there's enough uh, wind to generate at least 20, 30, in some cases 50% of the energy that you need from wind. So the, the nat natural resources are there abundant. Then um, climate change. I don't think there's too much to explain around the advantages uh, of wind power. If you just look at the CO2 that is needed to produce a wind turbine, it's CO2 neutral after three months. So the, the energy that you put in, you get out after three months and then it's about 20 years that you, you'd benefit from it. Um, if you then look at, um, um, at the economics of wind turbines, and um, I think there was a chart um, uh, earlier here as a slide that shows that uh, wind, uh, wind offshore, wind onshore is pretty close to being economic. If not already, if you would, count, would, uh, would uh, calculate all the um, environmental costs that you have with other generation sources into it, you get at least very close. And if you choose the right site, and I can give you examples of sites where, the, where you harvest about 50, if not 60 percent of the energy from, from a proper site selection. So there's also the economics of wind are, are um, improving. And if I just look back, let's say, um, wind industry, it's a relatively young industry. We, one of the subtitles, innovation. The turbines that we build now are 100 times larger than they've been 20 years ago. From about 50 kilowatts to 5 gigawatts and I'm sure they'll grow to a 20. So in terms of innovation speed, that's also something where there's uh, quite an um, achievement. And um, so the last one, and that of course is um, energy independence. Is the wind always blowing when you need it? But there we are, come back to the energy architecture. Of course, if you think in little islands, then it doesn't, it is probably sometimes not working as you want it. But if we were to create a real architecture um, around it with grids that work across the countries, then I think wind can also, despite of these um, natural disadvantages that, that um, renewables generally have, if you compensate it, plan it properly, I think that it can have a major share and, uh, and to really be a major part of the future energy architecture. Well, uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, I think I have a question to you at the end of the day. The wind, uh, how do you see it in the future? Uh, is it going to stay onshore or is it going to become more and more offshore? That's one question. Mm -hmm. The second, whenever you drive somewhere in Europe or elsewhere and you see these big things, which are not the best uh, beauties in the world in, in, uh, mixed with the uh, natural nature, I think the question arises here, is it really uh, completely neutral to the nature or this big uh, basically wings at the end of that disturb something on the ground? That second question. And I have a third one maybe later. Okay. Now maybe I'll start with the, with the uh, visual impact. Of course, first, beauty is always in the eye of the one who looks at it. I'm sure your view of it is totally different than mine. So, um, oh yes. <laughs> so first, clearly, it's a very, very subjective <laughs> thing. But I think that the the effects of wind turbines now beyond the pure visual impact have been studied now quite a long time. What are the the effects on nature, on birds, and um, if you go offshore on the. Um, the uh, fish population and so on. That has been all studied very well and um, the, 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 the negative effects are clearly um, very, very minor compared to if you see what other damages we do to the nature. Um, what when you then say, uh, when you drive through these wind farms, what I dislike most, of course, if one or two stand still, because that proves to me 
the wind is blowing, otherwise the others wouldn't work. And again, it shows that the technology that we put in is, is the key thing. We need to make sure that when it's, uh, it's time to harvest, that then we do a maximum, um, maximum job. And there, this whole innovation comes in what a company like ours, Repower, or other companies have to put in, get the most out of it, and, uh, and contribute. And then, sorry, the first question. Onshore, offshore. Uh, so the split and onshore and offshore, I think it will be, as the overall picture, it will be a mix. Um, I don't think we should overdo at the moment um, the strive for offshore. Offshore is a is very young industry still. Um, we have been doing it now for um, seven years, other companies for 10 years, but not longer. So we still are in the learning phase. And a thousand megawatt last year, uh, I'm sure the coal or the nuclear people um, think, yeah, that can be done in one place in one, one go. But on the other hand, there is quite a contribution that offshore can do, and um, we are in a, in a very fast learning curve. Next year, it will, learning curve. Next year, it might be two and a half thousand megawatts. It will then go to five thousand every year. But nevertheless, I think there will be also a major share for onshore, and we should not forget if we want to have a, also an economical mix. Onshore is faster, simpler, cheaper, so it should be a nice balance and um, I expect that that will be um, a, a mixed portfolio in each and every country. Well, thank you very much, Andres. You intrigued uh, with your, your remark about sort of uh, importance to other regions or global effects. A question uh, in my mind that I do have the feeling that at the end of the day, although the title of our conference here is about, uh, the forum is about Europe and Central Asia, but we cannot avoid at the end of the day the fact that if we take energy, energy security, energy, energy architecture, in many cases the solutions are local, but the impact is always global. And I think the balanced future energy architecture must be in a form that the solution which is local and that it's a good one is good as well for the global solution. I think that uh, city, beautiful architecture, doesn't disturb the whole architecture of the planet. That brings me to two questions that I'm going to ask our next two panelists. One question about, this, about experience, for example, in, in uh, let's say, Latin America with the bio, biodiesel. For a country like Brazil or Argentina, the biodiesel uh, uh, issue looks very uh, sort of a uh, nice and beautiful because here we are, we are producing sort of a crops from which we are getting some sort of energy or sugar and we are producing diesel. From the point of view of global energy balance or global food, water and energy balance, it has a lot of question marks. Are we all happy that that agricultural land is used and the water which is going into that is used in order to produce biodiesel which is eventually burned instead of producing food and keeping the water for the, for the poor of this world. And the second question is, again, it's all about Europe and Central Asia, but the world is also, uh, it consists of, uh, of many other regions. That there are regions which are still poor and living in a different world of energy security than we in Europe or maybe in uh, Eurasia. And with this, I would like to give the floor with these two questions to Secretary General. Thank you very much. I think that the new energy architecture indeed should be looked at from a global perspective and it must be inclusive. In this 21st century we still have one third of mankind not connected to electricity. We still have over two billion using biomass. So whatever architecture we design for Central Asia or Europe, it has to be inclusive. We cannot leave one third of mankind underdeveloped not connected to electricity and therefore uh, not enjoying the prosperity of globalization. For pure security reasons, we will not be safe. You, the demographics dictate that these regions in Africa, in Asia, will have huge populations. They cannot live in darkness. So I don't uh, uh, believe that the architecture can ever be entirely local. The R&D, the innovation might be local, but for those of us at the higher level, we must be looking global. A uh, second point I want to make is to, to uh, Madam Judge, the same three Ps that you want for nuclear, apply the same three Ps to alternative energy. If alternative energy had the same planning, the same subsidies and pricing, 
and perhaps capacity building, perhaps we'll be looking at a different energy mix. So I think in this new architecture, I think that Fukushima should be looked at as the Sputnik moment for energy, to rethink models, to have uh, 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 parity in pricing, to have adequate costing of the externalities. So uh, in, in as much as one would want to defend uh, energy independence and security, but maybe it's an opportunity to step back to say how do we make parity and give the same support to alternatives. The third point uh, uh, that I would make, our agenda globally indeed is for energy access. Can we connect the 1.5 billion people who are not connected to, the, to electricity? So that yes, they can have food security, so that their economies can grow, and in fact we create new growth areas. So the issue you raised about global governance on energy is important. So I hope that in this discussion, as we look at the technologies in Europe, that in fact we don't forget that there is the rest of the world. The last comment I'll make your point about China. I think China is a positive. Thanks to China, we see what has happened to solar PV. We see what is happening to wind. Just uh, last week, China announced that in Africa, for example, they will put out $100 million now to establish in 40 African countries solar power generating plants to create new markets. That's the model we're looking for in the 21st century, an inclusive growth strategy that brings others in. Again, independence, I think it's an illusion. Nabucco, your discussion here is about partnerships and pipelines. Is that independence? That means we better have better relations. But at the same time, companies in the north are heading for the Gulf of Guinea to source good, sweet Nigerian uh, uh, oil, crude. I mean, these people also need access to energy, which means the geopolitics of energy must change. It must also address energy poverty in the poorer countries. So um, I, I think that we should broaden the dialogue because energy indeed, apart from the climate change linkage, touches these other issues that will affect global security. Well, does that mean that we can add to the sort of a small portfolio of general human rights also the right of access to energy? Well, what we have proposed last year, and we are going to be proposing now, is that in fact last year we should have been bold in New York, heads of states and others should have been bold and say, look, energy access is the missing Millennium Development Goals. There is no way you can achieve any of those Millennium Development Goals without access to energy. In fact, if you take women, the people who suffer the most because of lack of energy access are the women in poor countries. They collect the firewood, they collect the water, they inhale the smoke. What we propose now, and which the Secretary General will be coming up with soon, we're proposing three global goals that we want to go take to Rio. Universal access to energy by 2030, 40% reduction in energy intensity, and 30% of global energy mix from renewables. We call it the 30-30 goal, all as a package. Even poor countries need to save on energy, as the rich countries do. So if you look at that as a package, this is universal access, but on a sustainable trajectory. Well, thank you very much. You also mentioned the energy governance here. And uh, I, in my initial remarks, I also mentioned that. I think it's, it's an important issue. But here we are facing a, a sort of a general human problem. Because as, as we know, there are around 100 organizations all around. And each of them has a specific agenda. It represents a specific group, and so on and so forth. You are related to United Nations. And how do you see, is there a chance that eventually we can overcome our weakness, put aside our sort of a corporate or sort of a regional or nationalist, national interest and come up with something which is the global platform where we discuss energy, food, water and so on? I begin to see a shift. Four years ago, if you had asked me, I would say they will never discuss energy issues in New York. Because you're right. The moment you say energy, it's about the politics of oil and gas supply. We shifted the debate to focus on energy for sustainable development. And I can tell you last December, the, sec the General Assembly took a decision, which for us was a litmus test, for you to declare 2012 the year for so, uh, so access to sustainable energy for all, supported by the European Union and G77. India, Brazil, everybody. So the idea of energy access seems to be ga gaining ground. But it is true, we still don't have a look a locus where you discuss energy issues. Yeah, the World Economic Forum, uh, your global reengineering initiative, in fact has called for global dialogue 
regular global dialogue on energy issues. I would strongly call for that. I think you should keep hammering on that because I see a lot happening on security, geopolitics, and the link between water security, energy security, and food security. That we need a place where we discuss energy for development, not just the politics of energy. Uh, given the demo demographics, given climate change, but it's been convenient for all that you separate it into different entities, don't even have one agency dealing with it because it becomes too hot. I think, again, Fukushima says, change the way you think. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Atul, now we come to you, of course. I would like to, to hear your, your initial remarks, but also if you can just comment what you heard. You are coming for a sort of a, a center that does the analysis of energy worldwide, and we have the representatives from different sectors, different parts of the world. If you can make your initial remarks and also some anal uh, analyze a little bit what you heard today. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try my very best to do the on-the-spot commentary, uh, yeah. as they say. Uh, I think one of the things to, to begin uh, this dialogue is, uh, I think everybody has already touched on it, is to think about a, a neat and clean architecture uh, is, first of all, unrealistic and probably unlikely. One of the things we know uh, about energy is that the energy business, and also the minister referred to it, is really driven by events. Uh, events really change the direction of this industry more than many other industries. Uh, and that's happened, if you just look at last 12 months or last uh, five years, and that's going to continue to happen in the future. So particularly when you're in Vienna and you're walking down the street after a nice rainstorm and, as you said, enjoy the buildings. You think about all the, all the design and all the framework which went into, you know, into this uh, city. I think it's kind of very difficult uh, to do that for energy. However, we shouldn't despair because there are certain principles we can use. This is the way we think about uh, how, uh, you know, the future energy system. I, I think one of the key words which everybody has referred to is, is the systems, maybe not using that word, but really referring to the impact of energy on food and water and environment. And I would also like to add land, uh, which is becoming scarcer. And a lot of energy, future energy we are going to get is becoming more and more land intensive. We need more land for the same amount of energy uh, than we did, say, even 10, 20 years ago because of the new forms of energy. So that's, we have to start thinking about energy in a more, a more systems way. The second thing I would say is uh, that we need to think about two very simple parameters and continue to work them. One is the energy intensity of our economy, how much energy we need to per unit of GDP. And I think if you look at Europe and Central Asia, obviously there is a big difference. Uh, Europe, particularly Western Europe, uh, has done much better than Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And they're within this, this uh, uh, group of countries, there is great opportunity for cooperation and partnership to improve the energy intensity. And then once you can get that uh, you know, uh, going in the right direction, the second thing is um, carbon intensity of energy. Ultimately, we want lower and lower carbon sources. Uh, it's unlikely uh, that in our lifetime, most of the people here, we will be completely decarbonized, meaning zero uh, carbon-based energy, uh, but there is a lot. There is a. There are many options. Let's put it. You know, and we we heard about some of the nuclear, uh, uh, renewable options, particularly wind and solar. Uh, they're all part of the mix. Uh, so when I think about energy mix, uh, I think about uh, like a kid going to the candy store and saying, "I want one of everything," and, and that's what we need. To, we need to have. We need one of everything. Now, it depends upon how much you want is a function of where you are in the world. Uh, if you are in Brazil, maybe there is an opportunity for uh, using biomass. There is plenty of that. Uh, if you are in Middle East, uh, there is, of course, a lot of oil and gas, but there is also a lot of sun. So there is an opportunity for that. So it has to be thinking globally, but acting locally is sort of an old cliche. Uh, we, we have to do that. Uh, let me offer, in closing, a couple of thoughts on specifically you know, what I would, uh, I would think as we look about of Europe and Central Asia, what are some of the real opportunities? And I can't resist talking about shale gas or unconventional gas more broadly. Uh, because uh, unconventional gas, though it may seem like it has been a revolution, but it has been an evolution even in the United States. It's taken 20 years of hard work 
uh, particularly for people like George Mitchell, who was a pioneer in, in development of the technology. Everybody doubted him, but he continued on with his engineers and preferred the technology. It took him 10, 15 years, really, even to get to the basics of it. And the last five years have just seen a boom. Now, the real value here is technology can be then used across the world. And that's the real value of the shale and unconventional gas technology. And Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, has a great opportunity in Ukraine and in Poland uh, and other places to really exploit that, uh, develop the resource base. Uh, there, are, there are many challenges, no doubt, but there is great opportunity. Uh, one other area which is, I think, is uh, right for innovation is storage. If, in the long run, if you want the world to be decarbonized, uh, we will need storage solutions. And, and Europe, in particular, uh, needs to be thinking, and, and I think the World Economic Forum can help with this, is to think about how can we create more innovation in the field, uh, field of storage. Uh, there was mention of coal, and I can't resist uh, uh, mentioning carbon capture and sequestration, which seems like a technology which is ready for the prime time, but not yet. You know, it's one of those things we have talked about. Every, every five years, it gets delayed by five years, and I think it's about time that uh, we think about innovative ways to really do a large-scale experiment. I mean, really large-scale experiment. Many companies are investing in small things, but it's time to scale it up. Uh, and then finally, your question about biofuels, and you mentioned biodiesel. Um, I think when we look at any source of energy, whether it's nuclear or wind or, or solar or biofuels, one of the things we need to look at is unintended consequences of things we put into motion. Uh, those of you who live in the U.S. may remember uh, about 10 years back, there was this, all the talk about the hydrogen economy. We were on the hydrogen highway. Uh, you know, it kind of became highway to nowhere. Uh, I mean, still work is going on, but this put me, uh, has been put further back. Uh, then bio, biofuels were kind of the, the best thing ever. Uh, and now the latest thing is, of course, electric cars, the best thing ever. And, and this is really very dangerous because what it leads to is disappointment at the end of the day, raising expectations which are completely unrealistic and then disappointment. So coming quickly to biofuels then, uh, our, our view is that there is huge potential. If you talk to the, the biotechnologists, they say, if you look at the book of biotechnology, we are probably on, and if it has 10 chapters, we're probably on chapter five in terms of drug discovery. We are on page one, paragraph one, in terms of application of biology to, to energy. So there is massive scope, and we should really be thinking about things like waste material, biomass, not food crops, not, not corn or, or um, sugar cane. I mean, sugar cane is slightly better than corn, but, but still there, is a lot more, uh, there, is, there are a lot more opportunities. And the, what we consider second and third generation biofuels will ultimately be a solution. And particularly things like palm oil, we should really not be, not be using that. There is really no, no economic benefit, no environmental benefit, and it has a negative energy balance. The three E's we should be looking at when we look at energy options. So it, it makes no sense to go, go for palm oil. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Atul. I think uh, I would like also to hear your comment on something uh, that is becoming very, very predominant, at least today. A couple of years ago, uh, the general public started speaking about nuclear renaissance until the Japanese tragedy. Uh, I think the renaissance continues now. It's just quiet renaissance, just a hidden renaissance. But the, the other renaissance that we see today is the gas renaissance. Definitely, I think, if we go back again four or five years ago, I think we were all counting how much gas is there, do we have enough, how, how Europe is going to supply it, okay, the North is fine at the end of how the South is going to be supplied. But what has happened during the several years have been accumulating gradually and have come to a critical mass of the gas renaissance, which is the development of the LNG as a technology. And basically, south of Europe has a proper supply via, through the LNG from the, from the Gulf. Now, this year, a, a lot of tankers have crossed, uh, the, come to, to the Mediterranean supplying south of Europe with an LNG solution. And of course, the, the, the shell gas is another source. So, it looks like it's the time that we'll price the gas uh, not connected to oil and gas will become a real commodity. So what are your thoughts? And I would like to ask, also ask Yuri about your thoughts about gas renaissance and the place of U Ukraine there. Please. Uh, 
I think one of the really interesting technological uh, evolution has been how much gas we have now. Uh, I mean, we are awash in gas, not just unconventional, but, but also conventional gas, through, you know, and that's being monetized through LNG. And, and we see, we don't see a gas becoming completely globally connected like oil is one single price, a price based on, um, on grade, uh, but we see it becoming much more uh, interconnected. You know, there is, uh, last week or a week before last, a first permit was issued to a U.S. company to do LNG export from U.S. to Far East, to, to the Asia Pacific. You know, five years back, we were building LNG terminals to import gas. So you can see how quickly events can change this. So we see it becoming much more interconnected, much more price discovery so that there is better pricing around the world, which actually, in a way, at the end of the day, will, you know, will be beneficial to the consumers because they will see lower prices because of much more interconnected. Thank you. What we are waiting today, we are waiting for new technical revolution and it was connected with uh, LNG routes. We are waiting that LNG terminals will go away and they will came uh, new plants which will not be connected with LNG terminal and will be such just like a flowing gas tubes. And we expected that in, uh, I think it's, maybe our colleague will correct me, in the three, five years we shall receive new technologies in LNG which will allow us to receive without such complicated infrastructure. And it will be a new technical revolution, we are waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just to add to what the Minister is saying, we are, we are starting to see what we call floating regasification facilities, which will be smaller in size, but the real advantage is you know, they are much more uh, scalable in the sense you can move them around and you don't need to big a massive LNG plant. Uh, and we are already starting to see companies uh, trying to perfect that technology. And it's, uh, it's going to even make the market even more you know, connected. Uh, well, thank you very much. I think we have some time. It will be my pleasure to, to address my question to, to the audience. Do you have questions? I think we'll be very happy to ask the panel to answer your questions. There's somebody down there. On. Where? There. Yes, please. Hello. Your name, please. My name is Nadia Han. I'm a reporter for Austrian Public Radio. My question is to the Ukrainian uh, minister. You said Europe had to choose between Nabucco and South Stream. Why do we have to choose either or? Can't it be both? Did I misunderstand you there? You know that uh, Nabucco pipeline is coming to European market in the place nearby Trieste, nearby Italy. In the same place, it's coming South Stream. And it, as it, they both came to the same market. And that's why it were, must be a choice from Europe what resource they will receive in this market, from Nabucco or from South, or from South Stream, because they came in the same point. Fine. Any other questions? Well, I do want to... Oh, yes, please. I'm Jochen Wermut, investor in Russia, mainly from Germany. Uh, how large is the shale gas potential of Poland and uh, Ukraine? If it is as large as what was discovered in America, then all of the European power game may be over because the prime minister of Russia had written his thesis on the new power because of the oil and gas Russia has. If Poland and Ukraine really has lots of shale gas, it become fully independent from Russia all of a sudden. Now, what I hear is that the Polish and Ukrainian reserves are not of the same quality as the American reserves are much more difficult to reach. Can you give me as much as possible information what you think is available in Poland and Ukraine? Thank you. Oh, um. I think the ide ideologics of uh, our amounts of gas is Kira. First time for you. Well, First um, for you. <laughs> uh, please. The, the total uh, uh, recoverable reserves 
in, in Europe, that is not just Poland and Ukraine, but all of Europe are smaller than, than North America, which is US and Canada. That's, you know, they're, they're smaller. The potential of how much of those reserves or potential resource base, if we should say really, uh, gets exploited is a function of many factors. So for us to sit here and say, it's going to be X or Y today, when very little development has taken place is premature. Uh, there is potential to, if you look at the current total production in Europe, not, not from Russia, but in Europe, uh, the, sh the unconventional gas potential is equal or larger than in terms of productive capacity. But it will take time to realize that. And remember that in the US, shale gas is not one single uh, you know, based in there, many, many different qualities. And what is being learned there, I think the real trick okay, would be I'll, I'll how quickly you can transfer waste. the technology, which is really being experimented in North America, US and Canada, okay. into, into Europe. And if we look at the learning curve so far in a very short period of time, I would be pretty optimistic. There's a lot of innovation going on in this industry, particularly in the US. Uh, let me add, add about our country, because I don't no close situation in Poland, but according to our country, we have first results about coal back methane and about shale gas in uh, Western Ukraine, which give us a very optimistic prognosis. Because the technologies which were proposed by American companies who make it, it uh, produced it in, in their country, shows and geolo geological investigations shows us great potential, but concretical numbers, it will be possible to say about them in the middle of the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. My name is Jürgen Wilde, I'm the CEO of the MNW Group. I think, Mr. Ayem, you made a very important statement that our energy policy and our energy development is very often driven by events. How can we bring some predictability and long-term view into that game, knowing that energy infrastructure needs a lot of investment and we need a longer focus than one event to the other event and coming out of that trap? Um, yeah, maybe I'll give it a try because um, I currently live in a country where it's, it's done, I think, way better and not event driven. I live in Denmark, a, a country that has now 20% renewable share and this is not by accident. It's because they started in the 80s to think about it. And it's not by chance that most of the, um, of the um, wind turbine companies that you currently find in the world, let it be Vestas, let it be Nordex or so, were once founded in Denmark because they started in the 80s when they decided not to go nuclear, that they then said, okay, we have to find an alternative way. And of course, I know it's a relatively small country, but if they have now the foresight to say it's 20% now, we want to go to 30, and they do all the intermediate steps that are needed and also plan now for 50%. Maybe one can learn from this, it's only a 5 million country, but they did it uh, in, in a very structured way. They have um, a very stable, um, um, of course, infrastructure, and just by taking the time and maybe the, the current example of Germany is just the opposite what you would like to have but here I'm more with with my colleague here to the left side why can't we take this as an, op as an opportunity now and say let's get away from this event driven because the next election is around the corner and what do we really want why can't we take this as the ignition to to a new energy age rather than now hectically see how much wind power do we need to replace the current nuclear power stations and how many grid lines do we need to build from, south and from north to south quickly? This is again the short-sighted, let's fix something and in five years we'll stand here and say, oh, we did wrong again. Let's take this as now as an opportunity to, to do it properly. And I, I hope that at least a country that is also my, my home country, maybe my second home country now, thinks a, a little bit more ahead. And, and for me, that's why I welcome the recommendation from your Global Reengineering Initiative. Let's begin to have a di regular 
open dialogue. It's not a negotiation, and no, this is a good forum. Technologists, financing companies, policy makers, to have an open dialogue on energy regularly. Then wait for the events. When the event happens, we have summits. Political decisions are taken, and then it becomes politicized. So I think that you should keep hammering on this need yeah. for a regular dialogue. You know, uh, I mentioned before what I, I'll make an example what what event and how it can it can influence to oil prices, for example, because oil prices is the most unpredictable and transparent situation in all the world because of financial speculation, and it's a problem which uh, must be decided sooner or later because it's a real danger for all the countries and for all, for all the economics in future. Because what, what is the connection, for example, between oil prices and uh, something happened in, uh, for example, uh, in terminal somewhere in Algeria or somewhere else? And what is the role of OPEC today okay. in stabilization process and the process which mentioned my colleagues to make a clear and transparent situation? Because every good have his price, except oil. And I think that all the world, sooner or later, must decide the question with financial speculations with all prices in the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is George Burak. I'm working with ABB. And we have been speaking about every single uh, fuel here and every single source of energy with the exception of one, and that's energy efficiency and energy saving, which we like to believe is the biggest one. And with the energy um, technologies that we have on shelf that need not to be dreamt up, but they're, they're there, huge savings can be made and not only we, our competitors as well. So uh, I just wanted to underline we should focus mu much of our discussion much more on energy saving, energy efficiency, and the more you go from west to east, the more intensive, energy intensive uh, the economies are and the more saving can be done. Even under the actual prices, um, most of these technologies are um, um, viable and are, uh, have payback times that are interesting, should be interesting for every single player. And uh, obviously the higher the prices for energy go and for carbon, uh, the more interesting it should be. And I think this is worth underlining and uh, being discussed. Well, thank you very much for your comment. I think it's a very important one because at the end of the day, this is the harmonizing factor that will work when we will design the next beautiful city. It, energy efficiency, I think, though, is architectural efficiency is the one that makes Vienna so beautiful. And I think uh, Lady Judge would like to add something. Oh, I just wanted to underline that because we're working on that at UCL. We have the Energy Institute. The thing about energy, we've all been saying is energy is a political issue. Even energy efficiency is a political issue. We need to change the building regulations. In the UK, we realized that if we could change the building regulations so that all new buildings would be built in a green and environmentally friendly way, if we could probably get 10% energy savings just by changing the building regulations, if we teach children to take the plugs out of the walls when they're not using their computers or turn off the television so the red light doesn't stand on or close the fridge, we figure we could have 5% energy saving just by teaching people from the beginning that energy costs money. We ourselves have it in our power to teach people that are around us to save energy as well as to get our government whether they want to have nuclear or not, whether they want to have shale gas or not, they all want to save energy. So it's all of us that are necessary to get our governments to put in the regulations that will help our population to save the energy that's so valuable. Well, thank you very much, Atul. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, add one other uh, point, which is around innovation. Uh, we had a, a session this morning about innovation and what blocks innovation. At the end of the day, in order to meet the demands, make sure every person in the world has access to energy, it's going to be innovation. And when I look at around the world, uh, I have to say 
the United States, in spite of all its faults, still remains the leader in innovation, including energy innovation. We were just talking about shale gas. Uh, and here is the opportunity for Europe and Central Asia to step up and really create much more innovation. I think Germany perhaps may be an exception to that, but there are, you know, it's a big, big continent here, uh, and it's kind of time to get ready for the prime time. And with uh, five minutes left, uh, I think I would like to go back to the discussion that we started to make a small comment because we spoke about we spoke about Russia and Russia as as a source of energy, as a source of supply, and we we didn't speak much about the uh, about security of not only the supply but also the de demand. Uh, we spoke about uh, Denmark here as well. We didn't speak about many, uh, many issues. We didn't speak about huge reserves that are in the Arctic area, which is basically a part of Eurasia as well. We didn't speak about, uh, about further in depth about nuclear, for example. We, did, we spoke, we have a star in Europe, which is France, but there is a rising star of nuclear in Eurasia, which is Kazakhstan, that became the first country uh, number one now in producing uranium, and it has a policy of doing exchange. There's a rising star in Eurasia in gas, which is Ukraine. My final question, and I would like to ask you to do your, to do your own final comments, is there is very often asked ask the question, so do we have to worry about the future? Because we're speaking about future energy architecture. And it's not only about the energy, it's about generally there are natural resources, about minerals, about energy, about water, and all of natural resources. What is that we have to be, we have to be concerned about? Is it the scarcity of natural resources or scarcity of our common sense and good management that we are not basically managing what we have well, including, for example, energy efficiency? And that is what, why that we're not getting there where we want to be. So in the future energy architecture, I think this concept of where we have to focus on the scarcity of the, of the source or do we have to focus to manage much better what we have. This is a final question that I would like to ask all of you. So I start with Barbara. Well, I think you've said a lot of it right there. Aren't you? I think there is, there's enough oil in the world, there's enough gas in the world, there's enough, there's enough wind and sun, and we can build enough nuclear. What we have to do is think about what the mix ought to be, optimally what the mix ought to be, and as I said, I think energy is a political issue. We have to get our governments to focus. If Denmark did it right by thinking in long term, I think that's, they've done a good job. If Germany maybe did it wrong by changing their mind overnight, I think the most important thing is see what we have country by country and become more interdependent. We said that over, over on the other side. Europe, Asia, we're all one world. We ought to take our resources, we ought to take our pipelines, we ought to think about our storage and make energy an issue that's an international rather than a national issue. Because I think that's exactly right. We have to, every person in the world has the right to energy. This inclusive energy is very important. But if we make it a national and competitive issue, we won't have a long-term view. Energy should be one of the clearest global issues around. And then we can harness the resources of the world and make sure that everyone gets their fair share. Thank you, Barbara. Andreas? Um, yeah, I have a little task for when you go home because um, we are talking about the, this balance and also Armin uh, talked about the beauty of, of uh, power and of wind power. When you go home, when you start here in Vienna, you will, you will pass by the first combined cycle power stations, the first coal-fired power stations, and we all get into the planes. I'm sure you'll also see a nuclear power station when you fly over some. You will for sure see wind farms, hopefully all running. And um, because all this, what we discuss now, is not only pol politics in the end, it's people like you, like us, who decide, who, are, who have emotions and opinions and Fukushima and so on. You have the great chance when you go home, look at all of them, 
and what do you think about it? Because that will partly, beyond all the science and, and economics that you have, influence what will get done. And um, then when you arrive home, make your little judgment and uh, we'll see what you come back with next year. Maybe it's not so scientific, but at least um, something. Thank you. Please. As we promote the agenda for universal energy access, we have built in energy efficiency. So I fully agree with you. We must look at energy efficiency. We must also look at resource efficiency. Our ecosystems cannot carry on with the current production systems. So eco uh, uh, resource efficiency will be, will be crucial. We ask you, the business community, to join the Secretary General's campaign, which we will launch soon on energy access, efficiency, and renewables. We're taking this political agenda to, to Rio Plus 20. We'll be including CEOs from major companies. And at this stage, all energy sources are on the table. So I fully agree with our colleague here. We must push for decarbonization. Reality is, it will take time. So carbon capture and storage, other technologies are relevant. And finally, inclusiveness. This is a world where we are all together. When there's conflict in North, Af North Africa, well, people <coughs> move to Europe. So let's not have energy security in Europe and have all the gas pipelines coming to Europe. You better have some down south so people can stay there and have prosperity too. Thank you. Uh, I would agree uh, with Lady Judge that we have no shortage of uh, resources. Uh, they are not distributed where people are. Uh, so that's, that's the challenge we face. Uh, the other big challenge we face is today we are emitting close to eight tons of CO2 per person on, on this planet. To get to the decarbonization, the goals you talked about, we need to be somewhere between two and three by 2050. That's the challenge we face. I think the hope I have is when I talk to my children and the young people, there are a lot more smart people going into energy and not into investment banking, and that's our big hope. With, with my apologies to investment bankers and all. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think it, <coughs> future energy policy, I think it must be solution because, between political and economical realities. Because I uh, agree with Barbara that politicals must play first role. I remember the uh, words which were say uh, last, uh, the chief of Exxon Mobil, who said that we technicals find shale gas, and after that you politicals find the price for this. <laughs> and I think that, you know that uh, energy resources is political resources. Only 20% of energy resources is in the free market. Other 80% are under the control of governments or companies who in their place are controlled by governments. So I think that it must be a solution between political decisions based on economical realities and what would say my colleagues from other countries and every country must uh, have his own national policy. But in common, it must be organized by politicals according to, to uh, opinions that energy security is one of the main securities in the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Minister. I think I'm not going to conclude because this is not something concluding. If I would start concluding, then I have to sketch the plan of the city, the next architecture of the energy, the next architect, uh, energy city. What we have done here, I think, and we are, I am pleased with that, that we had addressed a lot of issues. Because energy, uh, future energy, energy security is so wide, so it covers so many issues. So we addressed a lot of them. Basically, what we have achieved, I think today, because we ended up somehow, naturally, with a sort of a positive note. So the result is, I would say, is a nice watercolor sketch of the future energy architecture. It's not a plan, it's not a detailed plan, but at least it's an optimistic, beautiful watercolor uh, 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 painting. So with that, I would like uh, to thank our panel for engagement and honest discussion. And I would like to uh, also thank the audience for patience and uh, wish you a good evening. Thank you.